Thank you for your excellent questions. Now let's move to the second module of our program. In this section, we will look at the five competencies a manager must master to support ETK and to succeed. The five competencies are developing relationships of trust and openness, building collaboration and teamwork, managing by fact, which is essential for accurate assessment and continuous improvement, providing positive incentives to achieve organizational goals with rewards and recognition, and building a learning and continuously improving organization. Let's start with the first competency, trust and openness. When subordinates, colleagues, and the boss, not to mention suppliers and customers, trust one another, things work smoothly. People can take risks, they can say what they think, and they can admit their mistakes. They can deal forthrightly with those around them, and they know that they will be told the truth, even when it is unpleasant. To master this competency requires five key behaviors. First, communicate clearly and consistently. When a manager practices regular communication, it opens pathways for observing and learning. People work more productively when they have relevant information about their company and its goals. They know their jobs and performance goals and they know what they can do to help shape their organization's future. Second, the second behavior is to develop the self-confidence of others. The level and depth of confidence a manager's employees and colleagues possess will determine the extent to which openness and trust will operate in the organization. Confidence does not just happen it requires developing self-respect and knowledge, which together breeds confidence. You can build this kind of confidence in employees by meeting their individual needs for self-respect, personal improvement, and professional development. Third, encourage and share risks. Risk-taking can be thought of as publicly supporting what you think is right. Risk-taking enables individuals to embrace creative thinking and problem-solving, making possible the breakthroughs that lead to competitive advantages. The fourth behavior is to solicit honest feedback. Nothing will reinforce a manager's commitment to openness and trust quicker than the continuous monitoring of his own behavior from the feedback of his employees. And fifth, listen and learn. Most breakthroughs in work activity are the result of gaining insights from personal experience. It behooves an organization to facilitate the transmission of such knowledge to as many workers as possible in the shortest time possible. In addition to doing those five things, there are five things not to do. First, don't tell and direct. Second, don't kill the messenger. Third, don't resist change. Fourth, don't attack people, attack problems. And finally, don't criticize mistakes. The second competency is building collaboration and teamwork. There are great rewards to be realized by working in groups and finding new and better ways of doing things. No one of us is as smart as all of us is a truism. However, while experience teaches us that working collaborati collaboratively offers exciting possibilities, capturing such excitement is hard work. You have to learn how to teach your team to work together by helping them identify their objectives and clarify their purpose and by learning the skills of collaboration. There are five personal practices that will lead to collaboration and teamwork. The first, is practice is, the first practice is to recognize and use the power of teamwork. Success requires leadership in developing team strengths 
negotiating roles and responsibilities to better focus on business objectives and sensitive support of those who are not accustomed to sharing their ideas. Second, provide the training for team activities. To be effective at managing their work, employees must have training to improve their work methods and inter-team deliberations. Third, facilitate collaborative efforts. To transition from a cluster of individuals to a team is only accomplished by a manager who facilitates, coaches, and supports collaborative activities. As their facilitator, successful managers guide meeting processes and structure. As a teacher coach, the successful manager assists in methods for reviewing targets, work processes, and plan variances, including teaching and coaching. Fourth, recognize and reward team activities. One of the greatest sources of satisfaction in life, regardless of what our responsibilities may involve, is to be told on a regular basis that our work is appreciated. The fifth practice is to remove obstacles to teamwork. Spell out the advantages of teamwork. Make certain that the team has the training and skills to function as a team the resources to accomplish its tasks, and make certain that the organization's compensation programs do not work against collaboration and teamwork. At the same time you work to accomplish these five behaviors, there are five things you should not be doing. Don't delegate without full management support. Don't highlight individual performance at the expense of team efforts. Don't fail to invest your time in teamwork. Don't promote competitive suggestion systems. And don't fail to participate with your, team, with your team. Changing the way we do our jobs is sometimes difficult. But improving the effectiveness of employees and increasing productivity and profitability through collaboration and teamwork is the key to survival and success in the new, new economy. The third competency is managing by fact. Managers are expected to know how to make decisions. However, in today's fast-moving world, managers are encountering problems for which they have no pre-tested models. Their challenge is to gather the right kind of data to describe the situation, analyze it, and develop a set of goals and processes that are measurable. There is no time for rework. Successful managers today utilize five behaviors that will establish management by fact. The first, use the tools and processes of quality. Statistical tools and quality processes are the machinery that provides people with methods for assessing and performing their work, solving problems, and improving product service and process quality. The second behavior is finding the root causes for problems. A commitment to finding the root cause and effect issues in work processes not only uncovers solutions, but the opportunities for further improvement. Third, set measurements for process control and defect prevention. Expending effort to improve business processes is a major factor in being competitive in this century because failure to improve business processes will result in undesirable effects with no time to recover. By measuring key indicators, successful managers are able to identify the likely outcomes and to initiate action. The fourth behavior is set measurable goals based on customer requirements. This means acquiring the best possible understanding of what your customer desires, how your products and or services are used, and how you are perceived relative to your competitors. The fifth is documenting work processes. Over time, organizations become more inwardly focused, and people forget the impact of their activity on their customer. To bring customer focus and purpose to their tasks, work teams should document the steps of their work process, 
identifying deviations between the actual and ideal paths of any product or service, uncovering loopholes which are the potential sources of trouble. With these five actions in hand, the successful manager works to avoid doing five things. Don't let tradition determine your direction. Two, avoid relying on experience alone. Third, don't look for quick fixes. Avoid oversimplifying problems and solutions. And finally, don't focus only on ends and ignore the means. Management by fact is not an accidental outcome. It is always the result of visionary leadership, intelligent effort, desire, and skill. Recognition and reward is our fourth competency. A manager who wants to adopt the personal practices of reward and recognition should adhere to five key actions. First, understand the differences between recognition and reward. Recognition is the act of acknowledging, approving, or appreciating an activity or service. In contrast with recognition, reward is the direct delivery of money or something of financial value and serves as an appropriate, appropriate manifestation of ongoing recognition. Typical rewards are pay, promotional increases, bonuses, benefits, company cars, profit sharing, and trips. Recognition is always powerful, but reward without recognition is weak. The second action is communicating the rationale for recognition and reward systems. Successful managers communicate the recognition and reward criteria in their organization to everyone so that people know what is expected of them. Third, monitor and assess the use and impact of existing reward programs. Having recognition and reward programs in budgets are not enough. They have to be used. At a minimum, you need to know how much recognition and reward money has been spent and how much more is available. Fourth, seek and identify opportunities for recognition and reward. Too often managers miss the positive by busily searching for the negative. Ken Blanchard and Spencer Johnson made the point admirably in their famous allegory, The One Minute Manager, when they wrote, training somebody to become a winner is to catch them doing something right. The fifth action is knowing and understanding your organization's compensation policies and procedures. Managers are expected to administer their organization's salary programs, the policies and procedures consistently, equitably, and without discrimination. In addition to these actions, successful managers should also try not, the, not to do the following five things. Don't assume people work only for money. Don't treat extra effort as part of the job. Don't encourage quick fixes at the expense of long-term improvement. Don't recognize and reward results only. Don't delay reward and recognition. Success in the new economy depends on the day-to-day -day activities of all employees recognizing and rewarding their behaviors and supporting your organization's goals is critical to your success. Many of today's insights and competencies will be out of date tomorrow. The quest for new ways to think about products, problems, and processes to develop new paradigms is going on all over the world. Keep in touch with these developments and learning how to capitalize them is essential for survival in these revolutionary times. The fifth competency in support of ETK is building a learning and continuously improving organization. The manager who wants to establish such a learning organization must maintain five personal practices. First, treat training and learning 
as a required investment in human assets. Successful managers have a desire to learn and they expect the same commitment from their people. They see employees as assets whose value to the organization can be replenished over and over again. The second practice is encouraging people to learn from their mistakes. In an environment that encourages prudent risk taking, some failure can be used as a valuable learning experience. Failures, when viewed with the right perspective, are rich, fertile ground for learning. Third, identify, catalog, and publish available learning resources. Today's successful managers help diagnose what special or critical needs are important to the work processes and facilitate the acquisition of this learning. Whether it is simply access to information about customer work processes, or variances in production, or specific technical skills, or knowledge that can only be acquired by cross-training or an outside learning program. Fourth, make everyone aware of core competencies. At the very core of what an organization does, what it is as an organization, is a set of core skills or competencies. Microsoft would not be Microsoft without programmers who create the most complicated code and keep Microsoft the leader. What are the core competencies in your organization? Is there a sufficient supply of these skills available? Do people in your organization know what these skills are? Do they know how to become competent in these skills? Successful managers are learning the answers to these questions. The fifth practice is using PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act, as a learning tool. W. Edward, Edward Deming the guru of total quality had a rule. Find problems. It is the manager's job to continually work on the system, to improving the system. Deming's PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act Circle, helps isolate the causes for deviation to provide focus for improving practices that will assure predictability in the future. Successful managers also recognize the five things they should not do. Don't treat training as an expense. Don't draw a line between work and learning. Don't limit people's access to information. Don't be content with the status quo. And finally, don't stereotype people by their current job assignment. Continuous improvement in an organization today is like a child's learning process. A child is active. Suddenly something goes wrong and he falls. And he does something that does not fit the adult expectations. He cries, is upset, ashamed, and he realizes he did not know exactly what to do. Somebody is there, his teacher, his grandparents, perhaps. They say, it's all right that you made a mistake. I, don't, I care about you because you are somebody special and I trust you. I'm sure you are going to get better. The child tries again and eventually succeeds. He feels good about what has happened. He is proud of succeeding, of having overcome the difficulty. This is how learning works today in a successful organization. We have discussed the five competencies for managing in the new economy and supporting ETK. Achieving ETK rests upon the manager's behavior and actions, and these competencies will support this effort. This doesn't mean changing the manager's traditional responsibilities or accountability, but it does mean enlivening and expanding the manager's capacity as a teacher, a coach, and a leader. Lastly, before we close, I have some final thoughts about our times. A mere generation ago, in 1940, a Great Depression was raging in Europe and the Americas. 
The worst times had passed, but the unemployment rate that year in the United States alone was 14.6%. And a bear market raged. Hitler had invaded Poland, Europe was at war, and the United States was on the brink of entering the conflict against Germany and Japan. But a mere 20 years later, the US, Europe, and Japan were on the cusp of a boom that continues to this day. The lesson? The future is almost always better than the past. This principle applies with equal force and special poignancy today. In the aftermath of last year's horror, pundits told us that everything had changed, that nothing will ever be the same. They told us that the United States would rapidly become the land of the paranoid, and the global economy would enter the shredder of uncertainty. Well, that's not how it's turned out. To be sure, the images of 9-11 remain a pain that will never fully subside. But people are not wearing gas masks. Airplanes are still flying. Families are still taking vacations and the economy hasn't cratered. Certainly a whole lot of CEOs in my country are going to go to jail, but productivity still climbs and consumer confidence has remained steady. Entrepreneurs are starting new companies, innovation is still the name of the game, and most people in the industrialized free world still believe that it is better to take a smart risk, to venture with a startup, or to act as the internal spark in their company or team than to batten down the hatches. The lesson is that the arrow of history still points towards progress. Over time, opportunities expand, innovation goes on, and choices proliferate. This doesn't happen in one smooth line of free of hiccups, dips, or backsliding along the way. But the trajectory is unmistakable. As anyone in 1940 could have told us, things keep getting better. As we build a new economy, we are creating a whole renegotiation of culture. We are forging new systems, new industries, and above all, new relationships. And that is what makes this economy so fascinating and so encouraging. Thank you for your attention and my very best to all of you.